Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. Good morning. Welcome to Let the Bible Speak. We are devoted to helping you meet your spiritual needs. We want to help you to know the Word of God better. We want you to be able to separate the truth from error. We feel just like the Apostle John felt when he said in 3 John verse 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. So this morning, if you have a Bible question, we hope you'll call us at 1-800-380-LTBS. That's 1-800-380-5827. Or that you will contact us through LetTheBibleSpeak.com. There is coming a moment frozen in time when our thoughts, words, and actions will form a mathematical equation. We will either be in the black or we will be in the red. No opportunity will be given to make changes to our final balance sheet. We will either find ourselves ready for that great audit in the sky or be weighed in the balances and found wanting. We need to be sure that we find grace, obedience, faithfulness, and the blood of Christ in our column. They will all be there or they will all be absent. They go together. Ready or not, if they are absent, we will be upside down. We'll be overdrawn. We'll be in the red and unprepared to meet our God. That is the message of our parable this morning, the parable of the ten virgins. A closer look right after our song. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 1, reads, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. One of the unique characteristics of this parable is the very first word, then. You see, this parable is not addressing the kingdom of heaven in general, but it's pinpointing what will happen at a specific time. This subject is generated by questions about the second coming in Matthew 24, verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Another unique element in this parable is that while the Jewish wedding is used as a backdrop, the focal character is not the bride, but the ten virgins. Of course, a virgin is a morally pure young maiden of marriageable age. We find in Isaiah 7, 14, 
Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Virgins in our parable represent Christians, those who have made themselves pure through the blood of Christ and are anticipating the return of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. The bridegroom is coming from afar and the time of his return is unknown. Upon his arrival, the announcement will be made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, at which time they were to join the procession. This, of course, is symbolic of the day of judgment, the end of time. Verse 2, Matthew 25. Now five were wise and five were foolish. That's simple enough, but it addresses the internal problem in a nutshell. Whenever we're confronted with decisions, even small ones, we must be prudent. We sometimes miss the tremendous significance of wisdom in God's scheme of things. The Apostle Paul writes in Colossians 4, 5, Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Being prudent means looking for opportunities. Being wise or prudent means being good stewards of our time, understanding that our time is extremely limited. The Holy Spirit adds in James 3, 17, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. How often do we associate being prudent with gentleness or purity? Yet, God does that here. Wisdom again is highlighted in Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Wisdom says, leave it alone. Perhaps the most beautiful truth about wisdom, though, is, re is revealed in James 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. God assures the Christian that he will give us wisdom when we ask for it. But what about the foolish? What made the foolish virgins foolish? What distinguished them from the wise? Matthew 25, verse 3 through 5. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. So what distinguishes the wise from the foolish, the prudent from the imprudent? Notice that it wasn't that the foolish were slumbering and sleeping. They all did. It wasn't that the wise were virgins and the foolish were not. They were all virgins. They all had lamps and they all went out to meet the bridegroom. The difference, watch this, was in how much oil they brought with them. The wise brought plenty extra. They were stocked. Meanwhile, the foolish brought just enough oil to get by. You see, the foolish thought in terms of minimums, of how little they could do to get by spiritually. If that doesn't describe the approach of religious people today, I don't know what does. But we learn in the story that that approach is disastrous. The moment of crisis comes, the alarm sounds in verses 6 through 8. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. The term at midnight, of course, indicates a time when no one expected him. Notice also that the wise and the foolish arose and trimmed their lamps. They all anticipated his coming. They expected his return. The lamps represent the outside. And when you look at the virgins, they all look ready from the outside. But the foolish were low on oil. Now, all of the virgins had good works. They were all saying and doing good and right things. But the faith of the foolish was shrinking, not growing. Hence, the seriousness of disregarding the command in 2 Peter chapter 1 to give all diligence to add to your faith virtue. Add, add, increase, grow. This is one of the distinctions between those who are spiritually productive and those who are morally blind. There's adding 
or there's not any. There's growing or no growth. And how do we increase our faith? Is this some kind of hidden mystery that only is only revealed to a few? No. Romans 10, 17 speaks so clearly, so then faith cometh from hearing, and hearing from the Word of God. We feed our faith, we fill our lamps with oil by feasting frequently on the Scriptures, the bread of life. On to verse 9 through 13. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. They didn't have enough oil for everyone. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. We learn a lot about God in the parables, don't we? And the parable of the ten virgins is no exception. You know, we do well just to think about God. The thought of God humbles the human mind, but it also enlarges it. He who looks up to God will struggle less with sin, and he who hops instead to put the focus within. The thought of God can comfort the anxious heart and settle the restless spirit. Morally, there is no true north without God leaving the compass of the soul to spin hopelessly out of control. But the thought of God stabilizes the soul. So what does the parable of the ten virgins teach us about God? It teaches us that the patience of God is limited. The apostle writes in 2 Peter 3, verses 8 through 10, But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness or slowness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. We should praise God for His mercy without forgetting that our God is also a just God. God is a loving God, but He is also a jealous God. He demands and deserves our full devotion. We disrespect Him when we do any less. Ponder what Paul told believers in Romans 11, verse 22. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God on those who fail severity, but towards you goodness, if you continue in His goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. In the parable of the vineyard in Matthew 20, those who went to work early at the third, the sixth, the ninth, and the eleventh hour all receive the same reward. But don't think that you can wait until the midnight cry to get ready to meet God. You don't get that warning. You're not guaranteed such a warning. He'll come as a surprise. Incidentally, this parable shatters the idea that hell is just an unending nap. This was a time of great crisis, a time of great urgency. They were distraught over the consequences of not being ready because they understood it meant punishment. I don't know about you, but I don't mind sleep. In fact, the older I get, the more I value sleep. I do not feel threatened by the prospect of an eternal nap. And that's clearly not what is under consideration here. This parable is also a lesson on personal accountability. At the cry, the bridegroom is coming, the foolish virgins went into a panic. They were out of oil. They turned to the wise virgins saying, give us some of your oil. But there was none to spare. This knocks in the head the idea that we can borrow from the righteousness, the oil of Mary, of Peter, or Paul. We're personally accountable to God. In Romans 14, 12, the Scriptures teach, So then each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Paul adds in Philippians 2, 12, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Funny, isn't it, how people understand personal accountability in other areas of life, but then think that God will not hold them accountable? In this parable, Jesus is teaching the importance of monitoring our own behavior before the bridegroom comes, of taking spiritual inventory this side of eternity.
because the patience of God is limited and because we are personally accountable to God, it is critical that we persevere. This is one of the messages of this parable. Remember, these ten virgins were not separated because some were good and some evil, but because some were prudent and some foolish. All were virgins. All were looking forward to His coming. They all thought they would go into the wedding with the bridegroom. They all had lamps, an outward profession of faith. And at one time, they all had oil in their lamps. But the foolish became slothful, complacent, and negligent about the one thing that really mattered, having enough oil in their lamps. The prudent virgins persevered. The foolish did not. The word persevere means to persist in a state, enterprise, or undertaking in spite of opposition or discouragement, steady and continued action or belief, usually over a long period, and especially despite difficulties or setbacks. Some speak of the, the perseverance of the saints, meaning that once a person is converted, they will automatically go the distance. But this does not ring true. The Bible says in James 1.12, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. Folks, this is not automatic, no. Jesus says in Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Again, the apostle says in 2 Timothy 2.12, If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we endure. On November the 3rd, 1993, New York Times article reported a dispute between Marlene Linick and her husband, Michael. It seems that Michael wanted to watch the Cowboys-Eagles game, but Marlene wanted to watch the news. When he didn't budge, she said she'd had enough of that football. She went into the bedroom to fetch a 38 caliber handgun, came back in and shot him twice as he was watching the game. Mr. Linick survived the injuries to his abdomen and shoulder, and Miss Linick was charged with aggravated assault. Miss Linick may watch the news now whenever she wants to, but she cer certainly didn't persevere in doing right. In life, things will not always go our way, but we must endure as Christians. We must persevere if we're to gain the prize. Hebrews 10:36. Persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised. James 1.25, But those who look into the perfect law of liberty and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. Life has a way of keeping us from persevering for Christ. Our prayer life and private time with God get the squeeze. We neglect to assemble with the saints for frivolous reasons. We take God's blessings for granted and fail to thank Him for those blessings. We spend less time with other believers. A private school in Washington was recently faced with a unique problem. A number of 12-year-old girls were beginning to use lipstick and would put it on in the bathroom. That was all right, but after they put it on, their lipstick, they would press their lips to the mirror leaving dozens of little lip prints. Every night, the janitor would remove them, and the next day, the girls would put them back. Finally, the principal decided something had to be done. She called all the girls to the bathroom and met them there with the janitor. She explained that all these lip prints were causing a major problem for the custodian, who had to clean the mirrors every night. To demonstrate how difficult it had been to clean the mirrors, she asked the janitor to show the girls how much effort was required. He took out a long-handled squeegee, dipped it into the toilet, and cleaned the mirror with it. Disgusting, isn't it? But you know what? The Christian who, like the five foolish virgins, fail, fails to persevere, is likened by the Holy Spirit in 2 Peter 2, verse 20 through 22, to a dog returning to his own vomit. James 1, verse 2 through 4, Consider it pure joy, my brethren, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops patience or perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. 
an unknown Confederate soldier penned these words. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked God for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for but received everything I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. This parable teaches that we must choose either preparation or alienation and separation. Listen again to verses 11 through 13. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. In verse 10, we find that the five virgins went in with him and the other five were met by the ominous scene. As the text puts it, and the door was shut. Jesus identifies the five wise virgins with the words, those who were ready. If you look back through the parable, it was not that the foolish made no preparation. It was insufficient preparation. They had become too casual. This parable answers many of the questions people ask about eternal life. What about those who regret the sin in their lives but ought to postpone repentance and renovating their lives until it's too late? They, like the five foolish virgins, they, like the five foolish virgins, are unprepared. What about those who believe and want to be baptized someday but decide not to do so before the midnight cry? They're not ready. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. What about those who believe but haven't repented? What about those who are reading the Bible but yet do not believe? What about those who have decided that there is a God but have not yet turned to the Scriptures for direction? Just like the five virgins, five foolish virgins, they are unprepared. Jesus says in John 3, 18, He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There is such finality to these words, and the door was shut. As with Noah's ark in Genesis 7, once the door was shut, it was too late. The fate of all is sealed. You can't knock this door down. Screaming, shouting, pleading, weeping will not open this door. How sad, how tragic these words of Jesus, and the door was shut. What side of the door will you be on? If we find ourselves on the wrong side of the door, nothing else will matter. Being valedictorian, most athletic, most popular, or most beautiful will be no consolation. It won't matter that you had the high score at the bowling alley or the finest lawn in the neighborhood. All that will matter is what side of the door you are on. You're either in or you're out. You're either with Jesus or not. The door of the kingdom was open in Acts 2 in fulfillment of Jesus' words, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Be ready. We're going to talk more about that and tell you how you can get a copy of this message right after our song.
Without a warning, ready or not, the midnight cry will sound. The Lord is coming back. The bridegroom is coming back. Will you be ready? Will you be like the five foolish virgins who were unprepared and were standing locked out outside the door when the door was shut? Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. We hope you have heard God speak to you through His Word. If you'd like to hear how you can obey the gospel and avoid hell's fury, or if you'd like to get a free copy of today's message, Ready or Not, or if you'd like to be, begin our free Bible study course by mail, please write to us at the address to follow or call 1-800-380-5827. You may also visit LetTheBibleSpeak.com to watch videos of the program. Finally, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans chapter 16, verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.